Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm John Smalley, a librarian with the Public Library with the General Collections and Humanities Center, which is on the third floor of this very building, where we have about 70,000 poetry volumes, literary criticism, and drama in English, plus whatever is also in the 41 languages that we collect, also on the third floor. So if you have time, uh, feel free to check that stuff out. Uh, while we're waiting for a few latecomers, I want to uh, acknowledge our community and also mention two or three events that are coming up in the next week. On behalf of the Public Library, we wish to welcome you to the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush Ohlone have never ceded nor forgotten nor nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place. As guests, we who reside in their traditional territory recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community, and we wish to affirm their sovereign rights as first peoples. As uh, many of you know, we have poetry readings regularly the second Thursday of each month uh, in this very room, 6 p.m. Another poetry event that is coming up on June 5th, uh, sponsored by the African American Center, which is on the third, also on the third floor. And actually, the director of the center is here, Shauna. You want to raise your hand? She's in the room somewhere helping me out today. Yay, Shauna. So on June 5th, uh, the program is Sisters Across Oceans, a reading commemorating, uh, it's a poetry exchange between West Africa, Hawaii, and California. That's on June 5th. On June 15th, the author Chris Manjapra will be discussing his new book, Black Ghosts of Empire, about emancipation and its aftermath. That's on June 15th. Uh, there are flyers on the table for some of these events and other things. Uh, you may have heard also June, this June, as they're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the publication of James Joyce's Ulysses, so there's a ton of events and exhibits on that theme. Anyway, check that out or check our address, sfpl.org, the events section. So without further ado, I'd like to um, call up to the microphone J.K. Fowler, the publisher of Nomadic Press. Today's event is a partnership with Nomadic Press, the first of three um, programs this summer, and this is also the very first program of Summer Stride, the library's biggest annual program each year, our literacy program. So we are thrilled to be able to work with Nomadic Press and their uh, talented readers uh, and to kick off Summer Stride in this fashion. So please uh, give a warm welcome to JK. Whoops, can I have the bios? Thank you very much, John, and thank you everyone for coming out today to join us on this Sunday. Um, John asked I say a little bit about Nomadic Press. I think a lot of us know about Nomadic Press, but it's um, wonderful to be here as a part of this three-part series with the library. We also have uh, an exhibition in August uh, with uh, Shauna as the lead on that uh, for the Painting the Streets book. So you'll start to see pieces of the Painting the Streets book exhibited uh, in the library in August, I believe August to November. So it's gonna be up for quite a while. Um, the work we do at Nomadic Press is publishing and events. It's really community weaving. We focus on the hyper-local. We weave relationships on a national and now international level. And we try to stay as grounded and tethered to our people as possible. And that enables us to kind of continue to weave and, and do the work that we do. So the books are almost secondary to the weaving. They're beautiful, they're amazing, they're wonderful. They're a huge part of what we do. Um, but the, the support that Nomadic Press authors give to each other, give to their communities, the weaving that happens is really what we're all about. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here to weave a little bit with all of you today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the first reader, Lauren Wheeler. Whose book is there on the, the right side of the screen, but literally just 
got these copies the other day and Lauren has seen it for the first time today. So <laughs> um, Lauren Wheeler writes poetry fiction and about the places where the personal, the political and pop culture intersect. A recovering slam poet, she tried, twice competed at the National Poetry Slam and has featured at Cornell University where she studied English literature as well as in Los Angeles, Miami and throughout the San Francisco Bay Area. Lauren sometimes contributes to Black Nerd Problems, and her work has appeared in publications such as Pank, uh, Motor Monkey, Bicycle, and The Nervous Breakdown. She lives in West Oakland with her spouse, Kid, and, the two, and two brown dogs. And she's at Fighting Words on Twitter if you want to follow. Let's give a warm welcome to Lauren Wheeler. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for the invitation to read today um, to both JK and to the library. Um, and thank you all for showing up. Um, thinking about what it meant to do a reading on a Sunday afternoon, um, I decided to pull out some pieces that uh, sort of make me think about what my childhood was like growing up in Chicago. <clears throat> so I'll start with this one. Family history. A hundred people watch open mouth as two women run through Roseland, chasing my grandmother Rena's first husband with an ice pick. My great aunt Aline and her best friend Julia Browning will eventually become mothers of the church because God helps those who help themselves. Offerings. One, each Sunday, her grandmother would wake her at eight o'clock, pull the sleepy child from her side of the bed they shared, coax her into the bathroom. Humming, she would stand her in the tub, scrub her brown body with a coarse washcloth and ivory soap until she was clean enough to enter the Lord's house. Then she'd wrap her in a big towel warmed on the door of the oven lead her to the kitchen and the pressing comb. On an unsteady kitchen chair with a torn cushion, her legs twisted beneath her seat, toes not quite touching the floor. The humiliating steel, heated on the stovetop until it smoked, dragged through her hair until, gleaming and stiff with grease, it was straight enough to part down the middle, pull into two smooth, short pigtails whose ends her grandmother bumped under with a smoldering curling iron, fresh from the burner beside the hot comb. Two. Skinny and knock-kneed, I sat on a metal folding chair. Ruffles, a polyester nest beneath me, my legs bound in thick white tights. I carefully counted out the coins from the collection plate. Uncle Richard and Uncle Harry, my grandmother's brothers, both deacons, handled the bills, pulled them from the tiny envelopes and printed tithe that had been slipped separately into the white hollow cross with a slit near the top to collect this most holy of offerings. Into a clear plastic sorter, I slid the change after counting it into piles, tens, twenties, whatever the denomination called for ease the filthy coins into paper wrappers, the red of the penny rolls bloody as old ink. Watched as Uncle Harry slipped them into the velvet Crown Royale bag to be deposited at the bank tomorrow morning. Three. She has been shrinking for years. When I was suffering Charlie horses from growth spurts, my bones hardening and elongating, she experienced a different pain the pain of vanishing. Her spine was compacting, her bones growing hollow and pocked, coral caught in seaweed on the beach. She was folding into herself, like the cake she baked one Sunday after church that fell because I tap danced too near the oven. Pennies taped to the soles of my Sunday shoes, I bounced and stomped, the floor vibrating. The cake my grandmother had baked for us was flat, dense as her bones were supposed to be. She chided me, her voice a mild molasses contralto, 
and instead of the cake laced with lemon zest, we ate graham crackers lathered in cream cheese that night and played Uno on the card table in the living room. Murder, she wrote, playing in the background. One more. Ghost Town. There's a freeway behind my house, hovering over its shoulder like a falling knife. I cannot tell if it is safer for my son to play in the backyard where the soil is pregnant with lead or out front which is also pregnant with lead. There's a slug still stuck in the front gate from a shooting Thanksgiving weekend, 2009. My gray hatchback took a bullet in the bumper my first fall here, four years later. The street used to be called Grove Street. Now it's called Martin Luther King Jr. Way. In Chicago, where I was born, I lived on Martin Luther King Jr. Drive. Hundreds of streets all over the country named for a victim of America, a consolation prize. It's not even a good freeway. It's a connector. It connects one shitty freeway to another shitty freeway. It's not a freeway one would write songs about or poems. Though I could tell you a story about the night a cougar crept across it into the plum and oak trees at the rear of my yard and terrorized a family of raccoons. My neighbor and I whispered to each other across the fence in the dark, hands clutching makeshift weapons, listening to chittering, and then a low, deep-throated growl, and then a thump before the cat's pale silhouette eased down a tree trunk and skulked back towards the cars, speeding to downtown Oakland and points further south. The freeway is a dividing line, previously a red line. The reason no one fixed the potholes until three years after I moved here, a middle-class black harbinger of gentrification. The freeway is a dividing line, maybe still a red line, but I saw a white woman with fuchsia hair jog past earlier today, unbothered by the falling knife or the lead or the mountain lion or the dead black man this road is named after, or the one shot at the corner last week, so property values must be going up. Thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce our next uh, reader. Uh, we're next going to hear from Brandon Logans. Um, Brandon is a poet from Oakland, California. He has his MFA in poetry from Mills College, and his work has been published in the Patrice Lumumba Anthology and Variety Pack special issue, Black Voices of Pride. He might describe himself as a rectangular sheet of honey, 30 inches by 62 inches, six inches above any surface. Thank you. Oh, oh no. Cool. We're gonna see how this goes. <laughs> I told myself I would I would print out paper and I did and then I left it at work. So forgive me for using my phone again. The lessons I do not learn. <laughs> um, thanks to everyone for being here. America is a mouse trap, and I keep mistaking money for cheese. I fall asleep midday full of paper because I forgot that fruit could come from trees. Someone takes equity with their tongue and cuts me while I try to dream of rest. I wake up in a sea of anemones and blood. The bees have all died out 20 years ago. The young woman who develops a way to turn tears into bullets fails to develop a tool to make our sweat into honey. In school, they teach us how to use our hands as fertilizers to replace the hummingbirds whose bones now sing white and relenting heat. I harvest my hair to braid ropes and caskets. The riverbed remains dry, fish bones flicker grief. 
I forget where I left my body. I see the mirage as a wave before it slaps me awake. The sewers are the only source of water now that all the wells are empty. I mimic apology by opening my legs in the sand. Far off, a star falls like nuclear fission or memory or ache. Before a nation, America is the grave site. I hear on the news that despite the pollution, people are living longer despite being less of themselves. My neck twists into the shape of a parched tongue. I try to, think, try to drink my own saliva if my body would let me in on its thirst. Winter is a myth my grandmother fed me with her nails. I try to arrange myself as a rest stop for a future beyond this. I phrase the word love with my remaining teeth. I find my body near a cliff mimicking a butterfly long extinct. I wake up again, this time in a state of drowning I mistake as relief. I hold onto speeds of light. My hands blur while amber bursts across my jaw. I repeat in the mirror, today I am alive five times like Bloody Mary. I conjure myself like a ghost. I see a spider walk gingerly by my feet, a glass spear mimicking window pressed between my ribs. I reflect shades of grease and hair, a sea of teeth. Like all poems, I try to exhale. I'm here in the tub folding over, mistaking the water for a burial. My nose fills up first, bubbles forming pressure across my sternum. I try to exhale and diffuse the swelling across my chest, but the motion is as if I'm caught in a web, incandescent, dude, with many mouths. I am wanting. I lack sand to fill up my body, so I know when you punch me, it's not enough satisfaction. So I know you must punch me again. An echo of stop hitting yourself reverberates from the mirror. An image of a face meeting the glass, a hand tightening around its own neck, an exhale trying to escape. I remember waking up to the feeling of a presence of myself, of a ghost on top of me. The hummingbirds wing a blur like thoughts piling on top of themselves like bones. Like oil boiling, the patter of the skillet, the heat and the pain blistering skin aflame. I wake up and find pasta sauce all over the floor, and I might have been crying. My hands holding back the light, or my arms trying to cover my face. Moments later, I spill over, fall from my mouth as liquid, before falling over a river of exhales. I don't know when the sun set. Perhaps this is instead the red morning. I figured I still had the time to start over and wake up for the day. I figured I could try another exhale to resuscitate myself. I figured I could try again by saying, today, I think I'll try to stay alive. There are questions on how you should be perceived, how you should behave, how you should tongue your words carefully before speaking. If you fail, there will be consequences. The consequences may read as excessive emotion. The response, I will give you something to cry about. I understand punishment as I have to get to you first before the state does, before the state looks at you wrong, before the state decides to do something with your smart ass. Learn to hold back the tears with your face in the water. Transmute the excess feeling into a still surface. Be clear so all that can be seen is a reflection against the iris. The punishment of bodies set against what is normal denies first expression, then the body itself. A delay in recognition delays recognizing the psychological wound of a physical wound, of being a wound. The state 
looks for its father as it remains boy-like and tries to commit patricide like Zeus because it thinks lightning is cool and that power translates to death. It takes it a step further. It takes it a step, a step further. Death becomes wealth under the guise of Hades, hence fossil fuels, hence punishment. A scale to measure your soul, shame. A scale to measure your body, bloody. A scale to measure the time to grieve, to breathe, to rest, and most relevant to its success, to work as a cog for its machine. I remember when walking alone at night to be weary of even the lights. I remember I used to have a dream, but the sand swallowed it up, and I still haven't truly grieved its loss. I can barely remember a time, or did I imagine it, of a time when there was no fear that I was wrong. I know myself as a sandbank, patiently waiting for salt water to come and drape itself over my skin. I know that I am a home to a number of ghosts, the shells left behind, glasses tumbled to dust, bones and grief baked by the sun's breath. I want to feel the weight of water dragging me over myself, crown to navel to knees, slowly being pulled deeper into its tide. An aroma of decay, an unyielding pressure, a sweet crisp breeze between the tiniest of my holes and dimming lights. I am a number of tiny parts amidst the waves. I watch the sun and moon rise and fall. I try to make friends with the stars and pay attention to how different the colors of the sky feel against me. Daybreak smishing my cheeks, sunset tickling my toes. I cannot say who decides to rest upon me or what shape are those bodies I support with my shifting weight. I measure the imprints that they leave in their steps, tenderly trace their outlines while I wait for the water to renew and wash me anew. And then I have one more. <laughs> they name my whispers mirror as if I speak in a fog and my flesh often feels wet against the sunlight. When looked upon, I lay against the ground to remind the body is real with the concrete. By noon, I am often imperceptible except on cloudy days. When it rains, I know myself as a song against the house, a patter against the window pane, mirror on glass, frenzied rhythm, deluge refractions. When I sleep, I find myself in a bright room with too many lights to count. I spend time over several days that feels like hours or being punched in the gut or the slow pressure of hands around the windpipe. Breathing begins to feel like a wound. I want to be beach so I can feel acutely both the death and life buried there. I try to talk in a pattern to mimic waves or talk as if I'm in a motion of cleansing. I talk as shudder and royal to feel like something other than smoke. When I am most alone, my sweat reminds me I am ocean. I like backstroke because I don't have to worry about when to inhale, when to exhale. I build a home out of my hair, but my nerves constantly unloosen the foundations. If I must be a mirror against your eye, I hope that I might at least be a sight for you to find yourself. I have to remember, I am my mother's dream. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and then, am I, am I supposed to introduce the next person? Is that what you're doing? I'm gonna let JK do it. So. <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you so much. Up next, we have Nazila Jamison. I also wanted to mention, um, so Brandon Logan's was published in Patrice Lumumba Anthology, but we'll also have a book out with Nomadic Press called Phosphine next year. Um, so we're very excited about that. Nazila Jamison is a Bay Area-based performance poet, author, actor, vocalist, and MC. Her first book of poetry, Evolutionary Heart, which you can find on the table there, was released on Nomadic Press in 2016. Her work can also be found in Culture Counts Magazine, The Racket Journal, Issue 15, and others. In her spare time, Nazila enjoy enjoys writing horror screenplays and saving the day. She does host the Nomadic Press virtual open mic every Friday on Zoom, which you all are more than welcome to attend from the comfort of your home. And she gives the best hugs in the Bay Area. Let's give it up for Nazila Jameson. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm not classy, and I don't have pieces of paper I'm going to read off my phone. Also, I'm racing my phone because it's about to die. So let's see what happens, shall we? <laughs> this first poem, um, I couldn't write about what happened this week. I tried really hard, but I couldn't. So this poem is about heartbreak. The pain is not in the break, but in the disposal of the pieces, why the shattered mirror remains on the high shelf and roots reach snakily through the jagged cracks of an earthen pot. We hold on to the remains, embrace the delusion, despite our chipped and distorted image, ignore dirty water leaking, walk past flowery illusion, held together only by mud and memory. Sometimes are irreparable, some lives flourish when repotted. Some things are replaceable if we are willing to risk the casual, non-life-threatening cuts of cleanup. Grieve the empty space by filling it with the shiny new. Decorate the war scars with colorful, elaborate tattoos. Let go of pieces. After all, you were never the thing that broke. You are always what remains whole and ever here. This poem is called Declaration for Not Gabby Petito. If I ever went missing, would you miss me? Or is my hair too brown and my eyes not blue enough for your sympathy or concern? Or available photos of me too dark to look good every hour on TV? Would you actually search for me or dismiss me as just another casualty of the rough streets? Because I will tell you as I live and breathe, I have no diagnosed mental illnesses, no experience or interest in prostitution, no drug problems to lead me permanently astray, no desire to run away. So if I ever seem to disappear without a trace, tell them I am an upstanding citizen. I keep my obligations. I always call or text you back. Don't let me slip through the cracks into oblivion and disinterest. As soon as I stop showing up, have them investigate every lover who ever said they loved me and doesn't anymore. Get a solid alibi for my housemate. Interview my neighbors door to door. This world treats a black girl like an afterthought, acts like the brown girl was just never there. Do not let them convince you I never existed. If they tell you I was self-destructive, do not believe it. I love my life and would never intentionally leave it. There is nothing that I need to escape. Keep me in the 24-hour news cycle like you do women named Lacey or Gabby or Casey. Go on Dateline and unsolve mysteries. Make them write articles about me. Please, do not let me become another unnamed statistic or vague and irrelevant memory. Tell them to break into my phone, search this app and find this poem. Until I am home, do not ever let them ever stop missing me. This is called amends. I will not wait for anyone for me to forgive them. Will not stand by for their amends to put this burden down. Do not need their apology to walk away from sharp and heavy things. No matter how deeply the knife is embedded in my chest, I can eventually pull it out myself. I almost prefer it. 
I reject the salve of another to soothe the hurt they cause so they can receive self-manufactured redemption. There are definitely some who like to be the villain and the hero, would risk another's life and well-being in order to show up well-dressed to the rescue, get off on saving the day they very nearly destroy. I can provide my own salvation. I will not be held hostage in someone else's purgatory, paused until they figure out how to be human. Go ahead and be sorry. Think remorseful thoughts. Scream it to the heavens, to the God of your choice. No need to aim your past due apologies at me. Timing is everything. I am scarred but healed. You are late and I have left. Let us assume the other's closure and carry on. So this one was inspired by a note that was left on a friend of mine's door um, that said, Hi, neighbor. Um, could you please close your windows when you cook meat in the morning? Because it really bothers me. I'm a vegetarian, and it really bothers me when you have your window open as I jog by your house in the morning and you are cooking meat. So this was my response. <laughs> in church, we ate God every first Sunday, or rather, we ate the body of his son our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, washed him down with grape-flavored blood, went home in the afternoon and chewed upon the actual flesh of the dead and unholy. I grew up country poor. We only shopped in grocery stores for canned tornado food and milk. Our farmer relatives fed us. I spent late summers snapping beans and shelling peas for freezing. The first days of after schools cleaning freshly wrung chickens. By spring, we were usually down to hogshead cheese and fatback sandwiches. By summer, Dinner was grits and fried canned tomatoes. God bless slaughter season and early harvest. When I was seven, I once had a pet chicken. It was then that I learned the meaning of life. When I came home from school and she was silently on my plate, her cage and my belly were both empty. Hunger eclipsed my righteous indignation. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for this food. Vegetarianism is a religion proselytized by city-dwelling atheists and rich folk. It is an elite Western ideology, attractive to those with no immediate fear of starvation, consumers of billboards and articles and philosophies, drinkers of smug self-righteousness to wash down the multivitamins when the rice cakes were not enough. Humans at their basis eat what is edible. Country Christians eat by the Bible. Jesus gave the people fish, invited us to eat his flesh, basically said, fill your belly with what I have availed to you. I am no longer Christian but I eat what is available to me. My hunger eclipses your politics. Perhaps I'm wrong. Maybe my country grandmothers and aunties lived to their late 90s in spite of hog moths and pig knuckle sandwiches. And Mother Earth would prefer if we set domesticated food animals free to overpopulate and die from mass starvation. What I do know though is PETA protesters are made of meat. When this earth inevitably transitions, when crops dry up and blow away, when the last animals have gone to slaughter due to famine and waste, when there are no more chickens, there will be vegetarians. I will fill my belly with what is available to me. Hunger eclipses everything and transforms saints into saviors. <laughs> I'm actually serious, so remember that when you see me later. This is my last poem. I wanted to end on a really happy note. This is called So On. And so you love some more, because that's just what you do. Squeeze the broken glass in hand. Embrace the jagged rocks. Appreciate the warmth of your own blood flow. Let us celebrate the reckless freedom of courage, of walking a tightrope over a canyon with no net again, because the adrenaline rush is worth it, of double or nothing on an empty stomach when the back rent is due, because there is a sliver of a chance that it could be a winner. Your heart is already as battered and scabbed over as a wizened Hollywood stuntman. Why not? Why not run off the cliff into the bright blue air and risk falling to the cushion of a placid sea? Let us go ahead and wear raw emotions on our sleeve, glittery flesh-colored diamond cufflinks. We might attract another beautiful soulmate. Love some more. 
Be the brave. You might as well. Someday it just might kill you. Something inevitably will, but not today. Thank you so much. So it is my pleasure to introduce our next performer, reader. He is most recognized for his work as a co-founder and producer of Homo Hop Group Deep Dick Collective and for his development of the micro-label Sugar Truck Recordings. His cultural work and writing centers on intersectional dialogues on race, identity, gender, disability, sexuality, and class in popular media. He served six years as a music columnist, book reviewer, and feature writer for Color Lines Magazine. He lives in Oakland with his partner of 20 years, their daughter, a neurotic standard poodle, and an enthusiastically territorial rescue dog. Son of Byford is his first book. Please welcome Juba Kalamka. Thank you all all for coming out today on Sunday. And thank you, Nazil, for reading that poem about vegetarianism and vegetarians. I was a vegetarian for, from 1991 to 1997. And people ask me about that, and they're like, what happened? And I say, I came out. <laughs> and I started eating everything. <laughs> Both as like non-monogamous and as bisexual at the same time, 1995. So <laughs> there's a poem about that somewhere. I haven't written it yet. <laughs> uh, 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 as opposed to uh, bringing it up, I'm going to start sad, and then I'm just going to get weird, because um, that's just kind of how I do. Um, uh, this is, uh, they're all kind of short. Um, this is called Days That End in Y, um, and I wrote it the week that Michael K. Williams died. The report was no forced entry or signs of a struggle, though notation of the paraphernalia present was certainly a sign of a struggle, of force, of entry, of a good fight. Um, this is called uh, Shule Yawatoto, uh, School is for Children, and it's about cultural nationalism on the west side of Chicago in the 70s. February 5th, 1972. The usable restroom to the rear left had a single commode, a soap-streaked deco-gilded mirror, a gummed up wall-mounted powdered hand soap dispenser, and a mule team hand cleanser pitted face bowl that had seen at least four decades of cold water splashes that crisped a Menchie shopkeeper's cheeks and hid his homesickness and fading stamina from the, uh, from the afternoon customers. Today, I imagine that there was also the soft, bleachy, dogwood reminiscent aroma of a young apprentice's daily rubouts a morphine rise here and there, secrets of little deaths shared between little women, a kid with pocket change counted and recounted for caramel candies, now and laters, cherry mashes, or roller skate keys, plus innumerable lavender scented whole baths. The checkerboard tile floor is the only consistent motif of a recurring dream that I began having at age four. The dream does not abate until just before my 12th birthday. It always begins with my attentions focused on a corner's ragged molding near the floor. A thick, a string of thick, inky, charcoal colored smoke solely begins to curl up and outward from behind the toilet. I turn to leave and rattle the doorknob, but someone has locked me in, or someone or something is blocking the door from the other side. 
The smoke, which has no smell or taste, continues to billow, climbing upward and reaches me chest high before I begin to silently panic and think to scream for help, but I always woke up right at that moment in a light sweat and wondering if this was the beginning of the triumph of black nationhood me and my classmates pledged our lives to every morning. Um, this is called Magic Johnson, and it's about uh, my family on the west and the west side of Chicago that I grew up on. He keeps the wand zippered until just the right time, the precise moment. Surprise and attendant shock values being integral to the success of the performance. Rice boiled up to a perfect al dente, butter and syrup running over bubble-topped scorched earth trampolines up and over. Belgian Congolese ego compartmentalizations Salty, sweet, oleosocratic coagulation in Tuesday morning TV spots. A crispy coating delicately locking in deep-fried pepper-flecked anger, subconsciously rubbed into 3,744 company store-bought chickens, desperately kneaded into virally atrophied growth centers near closing on knobby need Mississippi girls sent home to die with their mamas. I guess I'm better off today, hipster enough to be annoyed at the irony. Tag, you're it. Run, hop along, run. AZ May is turning shades of pale, weaving across Central Park Boulevard traffic to scoop a red rag bologna loaf from a gutter corner stop that was constructed especially for her brothers to stand on. It's the miracle on Ogden meeting a $1.35 an hour Spiegelman. Ten years earlier and eight years too late, all in the same wormholing moment of a last poetic rip in time-space fabric, a pattern mastering of checkerboard and purple fleur-de-lis sewn into Buba, Gele, and Dashiki. Proto-Negro peering through tiny horn rims, stomach rumbling around 1130 while contemplating the contradiction of allowing white Commonwealth Edison and people's gas men into our ancient African storefront. Scraping clean the paper plate of curry powder, sugar, salt, and starch is necessary to survive the six months with no end that predicated diabetic and high blood pressure futures. Blood is now thinner than water. You've been soaking in it, girl. Rib bones float through a hot sauce cloud to the ocean floor. A moment of truth above deck finds him frozen and indecisive, contemplating the quiet overness in the wet blue dark waiting to consume the home team. Pulling up for a jumper, his feet fail. The problematic missing big toe that landed him on the disabled list last season. Or is it the chain mail message, an ankle transmission from the back of the line signaling a change in play? He can make 5,001 things from a yam, compress peanuts into phonograph needles, make boogers talk, last the soul to your last pair of shoes while spitting up chunks of lung, defy gravity's laws with the help of willows and oaks, memorize, memorize the lay of a town without pity for his folk and teach the shakers his Promethean recipes for curling Sankofas and Gina May out of hot iron. In any or all of those Lou Rawls narrated Anheuser-Busch sponsored minutes that got him through the 1980s, transfused by C. Drew's blood memorizations and the knowledge that he ain't supposed to die a natural death and that despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary, it's going to be all right. Thank you.
Thank you, Juba. Son of Byford will be out in July of this year, so stay tuned for that. Last but not least, we have Oakland's Poet Laureate, Idelia Nzinga, who also lives in Oakland. She is a writer, director, playwright, actress. She runs the oldest North American African theater company in Oakland and produces Bamdfest. She, like I mentioned, is the Poet Laureate of Oakland and her works Horse Heaters and Sorrowland Oracle um, are available from Nomadic Press. And her latest release, Incandescent, can be found from Amazon to Target and from The Poet. Let's give a warm welcome to Aydelian Zinga. There ought to be a rule, if you walk slow, you have to keep clapping. <laughs> <laughs> So, I don't really like to talk a lot when I read. I just want to read. But today said may need a little instruction. I have been thinking a lot about the traits of resilience and strength that are associated with people of color. I have come to the conclusion that I ain't trying to be resilient. Resilient means that something terrible has happened to you and you're still moving. When you say that people of color are strong, especially to mothers who've lost children or, uh, or children who are now orphans, strong instead of what? Crazy, non-existent, suicidal? So I bought you today a combination of my perpetual grief, my raw and very dangerous rage, and my mojo. The first piece is called Outside the Lines. Understanding is deep and fulfillment is true, he said in passing. Well, standing under knowing of things overstood is deep, but she don't color in no lines and longs for things, even in dreams. Her hands move along the sides of truth, finding herself at the edge of highways without lines, wondering what is what to do about the things said and written that shape texture reality not related to lives lived, dreams dreamed, things taken, things given, no denying, can't be forgotten, things that flow, hover, hungry, must be fed, tended, involuntary, reflexive, persistent, lost things, gathering in long shadows of new things, written on a song already playing been playing, replaying chords. Things float up in the waves. Red geranium seeds, prayers sown inside promises exploding in dreams, disconnected from the dreamers. At intersections of the then and this now, the future must stand on past actions, deeds. How else would it find the way if the unborn could not speak with the dead? Would we ever remember after transgression, transmutation, translated creation in chaos, ripples across oceans, rice, indigo, people, red cloth, tales carried through centuries, fill graveyards, cells, and coffers altering or fulfilling destiny, dividing pantheons, forking paths, origin stories colored, overwritten, kidnapped, hijacked by hubris-driven systems, lynched on survival into the here, the there, the nowhere. Asleep, she gives it to the water. She hears the bones talk about oceans crossed Shores of continents recede, approach, different stars, exodus, dispersion, death, rebirth, 
red geraniums, rice, sugar, coffee, red cloth tails, black bodies from here, there, nowhere, waking every day in a sorrow older than the pain carried in bags, packed roughly, leaving things behind, torn over standings, now standing under rules written, imposed, created under constellations with unfamiliar meanings, hard to embrace the thing that erases as it consumes. Sweat, language, land, Ways of life, songs of days, memory, custom, purpose, honor, dignity. Separated, asunder, scattered, waiting, not melting, remembering. Lately, she's been finding stray pieces scattered randomly between now, then, here, there, reaching for things that the unborn know, running errands for the dead, collecting legions of dismembered fractals, weaving the story from there to here, then and now. Simple sanity could not rest well here, even if it served. This be her overstanding. She don't color in no lines. Because we pause from morning to mourn. We park grieving to grieve. Always a reason to march, protest, push back. We speak truth to power, but power don't care. Can't hear, it ain't at home. It's out riding around somewhere with truth in the trunk. While power help us look for her. And I'm tired. I'm so close to weary. I can see the lights in the window. I live outside my own mind because I'm dangerous when I'm home. I am a straight razor. I've been cut to the bone, hollowed out like a gourd, poured to the dregs. This is not resilience. This persistence in bearing children, raising them is the intention. Grandchildren is the intention. Old people, the intention. Grandpa people, a divine goal. This persistence is not resilience. It's a war cry. Danced outside death's door. We go on because rivers flow and sunset and the natural precedes the perverse. And in the end, nature, God's law wins. And my anger is based in love. So I am dangerous. I would cross any line to protect us. To see us whole, well, and living in our bodies alive with our souls unscathed. There are no hashtags or slogans in this prayer. Just black bodies pushed to the edge of existence, still existing, and bearing children in resistance, and this is not resilience. This is a war cry. Pain worn publicly like Shango Red lying down the side of an ebony face. We are disturbed and very likely disturbing. Yea, though we walk through the valley of madness, holding our breath, we are sore to the touch and we are sharp edge trouble, bubbling in large pots. We ground to dust, press the powder, disrespected and dismissed by terrified evil, drinking its own Kool-Aid. It won't be content just to die out. We'll take the whole planet with them, buying and selling the last tree. Have the Afro futurists considered the Euro futurist? And what? What if we rode around midnight 
took only sharp machetes, left all the wooden nickels, food stamps, and nooses behind with those still dreaming milk and honey in a land founded in blood, maintained in blood, where solutions look like lots under freeways filled with dog houses that people sleep in. And I am tired, close to weary, a hollow gourd poured out, I am dangerous. I know what's at the bottom of the Kool-Aid pitcher and I ain't thirsty. You catch me in the whirlwind or on the yellow line on the freeway, two exits past, mining how I behave. Under the moonlight coming smooth undone, under the swoon of remembering what you done done to my song. Off key now, and the rewind is broke, and we are where Prayers do not land, and they don't do hope, and we can dance. We can dance. This ends somewhere. And the thought of it smells like hot iron and funeral hymns. And I know all the words, and we can dance. We can dance. You know, I have likely always been magic. I cannot remember a time where I could afford not to be magic. Likely at five years old, I was most likely magic already. Probably had been that way from the start or before. Born with a call over my eyes and all, likely was magic right away. Trials and tribulations follow magic, and they done followed me all my life. I always had to be magic just to hold the idea of me surviving odds and failing to be a statistic. I had to be magic to conjure survival. Magic kept the candle lit in a storm of a life, a sink or swim kind of journey, requiring all three eyes, looking for the signs, searching for the keys, waiting in the gray everydayness of things endured, like poverty, young parents, no inheritance, and leaky bags of secrets that weigh a lot, but don't pay no bills, you got any intentions on paying. It's a good thing that I remembered I was magic sooner than later. You see, later is rarely ever better than sooner, although it do got its place. You know, they do say greater later. Magic is tricky. And mine ain't no different. Now, sometimes I think it worked better before I knew about it, before I learned the cost of things and how not to blow up a room with my thoughts or to tell the truth to fools. Because those kinds of things wear hard on fools. Because they bring it on themselves with their hands over their eyes, unaware and bereft of magic, full of privilege, but unlucky, lucky, but not magic. Yeah, I've probably always been magic. Ain't really no need for me to color in the lines. Because magic likes its understandings deep, and it plants itself in bright pennies that grandmas wish on and grandfathers dream on. Seeds planted in an intentional universe where there are no lines between anything. And most of the time, the answer is yes. And bright children learn how to fly because there's sky and magic to be tended. Always been magic. I never eat from empty plates, bowl before bone. My cups always overflow. Good character is my companion. Good fortune follows me. Abundance sits at my table. All my dreams come true. They attract other dreamers, flying in and out the everywhere, only sky above us. I was born magic, unlikely, impractical, an indulgent manifestation, prayed for and predicted, tested, true and bold, remembering to remember. That's 
most likely always magic. Y'all say? Y'all say. Thank you all so much for coming. Let's give a warm welcome or a warm thank you to all of the presenters, the readers tonight. Ayadeli Nzinga, Brandon Logans, Nazila Jameson, Juba Kalamka, Lauren Wheeler. Um, we will stick around just for a few minutes. Uh, there are some books up on the table. Um, we do not have Juba's book yet, and we do not have Brandon's book yet, but we will have those soon. And if you enjoyed what you heard from any of the writers, please go up and tell them. Tell them how much you enjoyed their work and what it meant to you. Um, I am going to pass it off quickly to John again, and you'll see me over here at the table shortly. Thank you. Thank you, JK. And as another thank you to the readers. That was really fabulous. There's more coffee and cookies for folks. And please come up and take a look at the books here. Uh, if you have time, also come up to the third floor and look at what poetry we have up there, too. Thank you all. <laughs>